Today in the studio, folks, I've got an interesting treat for you. Seth Ferranti, welcome to the show. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Guys, if you don't know Seth Ferranti, this dude is a writer-director. If you've seen a documentary called, I think it was called White Boy Rick, wasn't it? Oh, White Boy. White Boy, about uh, the drug dealer White Boy Rick. But just come find out, old Seth received a 25-year prison sentence yourself for being the LSD kingpin. Huh? Oh, be damned. And then you faked your suicide, and you were on the U.S. Marshals' top 15 most wanted list. Yeah, for like, two years, two years. Yeah, but like that must have been heavy duty. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was only 20, but, you know, when you're, when you're facing like 20 to life, you know, and your only other option is to like rat out your friends. I mean, I felt like I didn't have a choice. You know, I had to run. I had to, uh, you know, kind of remove myself from the situation that I found myself in. It eventually caught you, though, yeah? Yeah, two years, you know, I, I kept I kept selling weed. I was actually running loads of weed from Dallas, Texas, up to St. Louis. And, I mean, it was the height of the war on drugs. So, you know, when you do that type of stuff at that time, you know, this is like the era when they considered cannabis to be like, you know, heroin. So, you know, I kept putting myself at risk, and I eventually got caught. So did you do prison time for weed? Yeah, I did prison How's time. It? Yeah, I did 21 years for uh, weed and LSD. How does it feel? that now it's legal as a beagle. Yeah, you know, I kind of look at it like, um, you know, I feel justified because I always tell people I never considered myself a criminal. I considered myself an outlaw. I broke laws that I thought were wrong. You know, I'm, I'm a man of conviction. So even though the law said that this was wrong, you know, I felt like these were righteous drugs, you know, like cannabis and psychedelics. So, you know, I feel kind of like maybe a, a man a little bit before my times. And yeah, I had to pay the price. But, you know, I, I think, all everything that I did has has led up, you know, to this, and I kind of feel real justified in my attitudes today. Well, now that it's legal, it kind of would piss me off. Like, dude, if I did twenty years, if I did one year for weed, now you threw an LSD, that's still illegal, so it doesn't quite count. But I don't think that should be illegal either. By the way, yeah. no, I think psychedelics should be legal too. But but uh, well, in my opinion, dude, I mean, again. I'm about rights. Like, dude, you're a human being. You want to go do some stupid shit, go out there in the woods and do whatever stupid shit you want. I don't think there should be controlled substances, but I'm, I'm a crazy whack job when it comes to that. Like most people aren't going to agree with me. Why? Well, I don't know. They're worried about their kids and all this bullshit. I'm not, I don't go that far. I think you're an adult. You want to smoke weed, shoot up heroin, uh, do cocaine, whatever it is that they say is illegal, control one substance, oxycodone, whatever the major drugs are, PCP, and you're a hu a, an adult human being, you want to do it? I don't think anyone should tell you you can't do it. Now, you can't sell it to little kids? Yeah, that should be a law. You know, you, there, there's, in other words, I'm not just straight up do what you want in the world. We'd, we'd have a shitty world. But weed, it's never been any kind of drug that, that, caused problems. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, like, dude, you get stoned, you watch TV and get the munchies. You don't, you know, go rob banks and freaking get into trouble. Like it's just weed. Or even get into fights. You know, I, I always looked at it like, why are some substances, you know, like, like alcohol, tobacco, you know, caffeine, you know, sugar, why are these substances legal and these other substances are illegal. And, you know, I think in this country, I mean, for me, a lot of the times it comes down, you know, it comes down to money. It comes down to who's controlling the industry, How who's do you lobbying it? the government, Yep. you know, so that's why one thing, okay, these substances are okay. Cause anybody, anybody would say that weed is not as harmful as alcohol, but I yet, agree. but yet alcohol has been legal all this time and, and they've been putting people in prison for weed. So, you know, finally, you know, we've reached that point, but, uh, yeah, man, I, I feel justified. I, I was angry, man. I was angry like my first, you know, five, five or six years. I was really, really angry. But, um, Dude, you know, when you're in there, you can't let, you can't keep that anger. That anger is just going to eat you up. So I, I channeled my anger, you know, into positive pursuits. You know, while I was in prison, I got three college degrees, an associate's, bachelor's, a master's degree. I started writing books. And, um, you know, that kind of set the stage for, for where I'm at today. You think the fact of writing the book, there's something therapeutic about that? Oh no, definitely. I think it's it's like 
you know, when you set a goal, you know, you, you say, okay, I'm going to do this. I mean, writing a book is a monumental task. You're talking like 60, 80,000, 100,000 words. You know I mean? That's no easy task. And you have to keep editing it, go over it, you know, and making it right. So I think it's just the uh, accomplishing something, you know, setting a goal and accomplishing it. For me, that's what was real therapeutic. And that's what got me through my time, you know, because cause I'm in there, you know, I'm kind of living, you know, like in a fishbowl, you know, but at the same time, I knew... I had to do something for when I got out, you know, I, I saw the future. I didn't have life, you know? So I was like, man, what can I do, you know, to help myself when I got out? So that was like really the therapy, the, the accomplishment, you know, was therapeutic for me and, and setting the stage for when I eventually, you know, emerged from uh, inside the belly of the beast. That was kind of my thing. Dude, you got, I mean, you don't look that old right now. Like, so like, when'd you get out? Like yesterday? No, I got out uh, 2015. So it's been a minute. Yeah. So I went in 93 when I was uh, 22, and I got out in 2015 when I was 43. Dude, that is a freaking dog's ass age. Like, dude, that's a long time to be. How, you didn't get institutionalized? No, you know, in there they got a saying, right? They say, uh, do the time. Don't let the time do you. So, you know, I kept, I kept my mind outside the fences. You know, I, I read a lot. You know, I just kept my mind occupied because some dudes, they get so into like the drama and the intrigues and the politics of, of prison life. And, you know, like what's going on and who's controlling what or, you know, what gangs are bringing what in. And they let that consume them, you know, or they get where they just want to become, you know, they want to become like the super violent guy that everybody's scared of. You know, so I kind of tried to stay away from that. You know, I kind of stayed in the law library you know, the education building, typing stuff up. I mean, I was still in the yard. I played sports and I worked out. Sometimes you, know, you can't avoid it, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, but that's what you got to do. When you got to deal with something, you just got to deal with it. You know? Well, if there's some young buck listening to this right now that's heading to prison, let's give them three tips to know before going to prison. I mean, this is what they told me when, when I came in. They said, you know, don't gamble. They said, don't do drugs. And they said, don't fuck with punks. That's kind of like the three. What are punks? The gay guys? The gay guys, yeah. That's how you get in trouble in there. You know, you gamble, you run up debts, you know, and then you got to, you know, somebody's going to come get you or you got to do something to somebody if you owe them money. You know, if you get involved in drugs, you know, you can get strung out and run up debts. And then, you know, like the, the homosexuals in there, you know, some dudes partake in that and that's like the women. So, you know, just like dudes get in fights and women out here, you know, dudes get in fights over uh, homosexuals in there. Well, the third one's pretty easy, I think. But you know, you'd shit. You'd think after twenty three years, shit, it start getting harder and harder. After a while, what about the people with life? Yeah, no, that's why you you got a lot of dudes like um, I always refer to them as uh, you know, they call them homo thugs because they're dudes. I mean, like these dudes are gangsters. You know, like you don't want to try these dudes. Like these dudes will stab you. But you know, a lot of the dudes that do have life. You know that, I mean, they, they eventually go that route. I mean, you know, they want love or whatever, but they also say too, like in there, they say like, if it's in you, you know, it's in you. And that has more meanings than one, you know, it's just, you know, whatever situation you're in, you know, I was in for 21 years. I could have had plenty of opportunity to go that route, but I never did, but I know dudes that did. So, you know, whatever, you don't hold it against them. I know dudes that went that route inside and now they're back out and they're with women. So, you know, maybe they were just by, I don't know. They, they, they say something like uh, straight to the gate or there's some saying. Oh, yeah. No, it's called. Uh, it's called. Uh, gay while you yeah, stay. No, gay for the stay, straight at the gate. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's called. Hey, look. So, look, I, I also got this project that I'm working on. Um, I haven't sold it yet, but uh, I actually interviewed this dude who he came in. He was straight. He had a life sentence and he was in for 10 years. And then after 10 years, like. I guess he wanted some love. So he decided, you know, he wanted to be the male, you know, in, in the gay relationship, you know, and then eventually after like five or six years, I guess he got bored with that. Then he decided he wanted to be, you know, the, the, the bottom or the, the female in the relationship. And then he got a pardon and he got out of his life sentence. And then now he dates, you know, girls again. So, um, I actually had a book I did that my agent had that was, he was trying to sell that was called a uh, gay for the stage straight at the gate. You know, to me, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, it can be humorous in a way, like like in a prison, you know, alpha male, humorous kind of way. But I don't know. I always tell people, too, like the uh, those those gay dudes in there, I mean, dude, like sometimes, like when you grow up, you think like, oh, gay dudes, like whatever, you know, they're pussies. Those dudes are tough, man. 
Like those dudes they will stab you, man. Like, you know, they're not, you know, you, you don't trifle with those dudes. You know what I'm saying? Your company, Gorilla Convict, your publishing company. Did you have that when you were in there? Did you start that while you were in there? Yeah, so I started that. Um, I started publishing books while I was in uh, 2005, and I started that company, Gorilla Convict, and I started a blog. And um, basically, I, I started writing the end of the 90s. I started getting published by, uh, you know, I was doing a column for Vice when Vice was just like this uh, kind of this low-rent GQ kind of punk rock magazine, you know, before they really blew up. I was doing a column for them called I'm Busted, you know, every month. And it was cool, too, because uh, they were paying me like $500 a month. And like for $500 in prison, like you live like a king. You know, like people think you're a millionaire and stuff because a lot of people, they make like five twenty dollars $20 a month. You know, it's basically like slave labor in there. So um, I was writing all this stuff and I had all these different stories that I couldn't get published because there weren't a lot of uh, outlets, you know, that would publish, you know, the kind of stuff that I was writing. And so that's when eventually I got the idea. You know, that was like when the blogs were becoming popular, like the early 2000s. And I would like read about it in magazines. So I just started Guerrilla Convicts, which it was a blog, but it was also a publishing house. I put out my first book, uh, Prison Stories, which is kind of like an autobiographical uh, tale of my, my first two years in prison. What prison were you in? I started out in SCI Manchester in Kentucky. It's a medium to high security prison. I was there from like 93 to 96. That's a state? No, feds. I was in all in the feds, federal prison. So I got, I got a 25-year What's, did you say SCI? FC, they call it oh, FCI, F. FCI, yeah. They, yeah. like it's Federal Correctional Institution. So kind of like in, in the feds, they, they have like the levels, they have like the super max, you know, that's like places where, uh, you know, they put like the Unabomber and stuff. That's like 24 hour lockdown, you know, like they really can't do anything. Then they have like, they call the USP, it's called a United States Penitentiary. That's like the high that's where, like, you know, they got the violent dudes, a lot of lifers, and kind of the attitude is there. They say, like, uh, in the USPs, they say, boys fight, men kill. And then I did 12 years. I started out in the FCI's Federal Correctional Institution. That's, like, the mediums, and they're known as gladiator schools. So I did 12 years, like, in the gladiator schools, and it's just, like, you just got to fight. I mean, people get stabbed, but, you know, they just stab somebody, like, two, three, four times, like, we're in the penitentiary in the high, like where they say, you know, boys fight, men kill, like they're trying to kill you. They're stabbing you like 60 times. It's a beef. They're not throwing their hands, you know? And then, then I did, so I did 12 years in the mediums and then I did nine years in the low and the low security prison. I mean, once you've been in the medium, I mean, it's pretty tame, you know, and then below that they got camps. Yeah. The minimum, which I never made it to the camp because uh, I was a fugitive you know, I was top 15 U.S. Marshals list for two years, so they said I was an escape risk, so I couldn't go to a camp. Because the camp, you know how they escape? There's no fence. They they call cabs. Yeah, yeah. there's that's, no that's fence. That's not a joke. Yeah. No, I know. I know. I knew dudes that were at camps, you know, that violated at camps and then were sent back up to the lows or mediums, and they would tell me, like, crazy stuff. I mean, they would go to, like, the hotels, you know, with their girls. Like, they would basically get anything they wanted. It's almost like you know, being on the street or being like in a work release program where you have access to the street. Yeah. Yeah. So, but still dude, that's a long fucking time. Yeah. But when, when you get that 25 your mindset years, though, dude, your mindset, like you, 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 there's something to be said about you kept your mindset right because dude, a lot of people, they can do five years. They might even be able to do 10 years, but dude, that's a long fucking time, which means you, constantly and must have intentionally developed the mindset. And like you said, you just kept it on the outside because a lot of people get in, in institutionalized where they get out and they're like, they do shit to go back in. That's life to them. Yeah. It's crazy. But you came out, you started writing shit. Now you got freaking, you know, movies and documentaries and books and you got all kinds of projects cooking, you know, that, that, I don't know how you would do that. Like, dude, that's a strong mindset right there. How did you develop that? Yeah, I think when it, when I went in, man, you know, because I, I kind of, I was a military brat. You know, my dad was in the military, so I kind of grew up like middle class suburbs. And, you know, really, when I look back now, you know, I'm 50. So when I look back now, I mean, I was really kind of like a little entitled fucking punk little kid, you know. So, but then... You know, I, I was an outlaw and I was smart and I was doing a lot of different stuff, you know, with with, with the, the drugs. But, uh, 
you know, I, just, I was just like, really, I, I was a punk kid, man. And so when I went in, you know, I had to grow up. I had to grow up. I went in at 22. I had to grow up like really fast, you know, like, like if you don't grow up in there and become a man, like, you know, I mean, at, at, at best, you know, you can get extorted, you know, for money at worst, you can get raped, you know, or even, or even killed. So, I mean, you got to grow up and you got to become, well, a, which one of those is worse? I mean, getting raped would be the worst. That's what I'm thinking. I might rather be killed. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just, when I went in, man, I just, I kind of adopted, I knew I had a long time to do, right? So really, this is what I did, because I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm kind of like an academic dude. You know, I like to read a lot. I like to learn about stuff and then kind of form my own way or my own opinion. So when I first got in, I started reading all these like uh, classic prison literature books, like uh, in 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 the Belly of the Beast by Jack Henry Abbott, Soledad Brother by George Jackson, uh, Live from Death Row by uh, Mamiya Bul Jamal, and these were kind of like almost like my my textbooks for prison. Like I read like for two years, I read every book I could like on prison life, you know. And and from these and just kind of being around and just kind of you know staying quiet and kind of staying in the background you know, not really jumping out there, you know, I kind of, I kind of learned, man. And, and I got lucky too. Cause I, I always tell people, right. I always find myself in, um, even though I find myself in fucked up situations, you know, like getting 25 years, I mean, that's fucked up. But at the same time, I find myself in a lot of, you know, like good situations. Cause I came right in, I got an Italian last name. I'm on the East coast. There's a ton of mafia dudes, right? So right when I get on the compound, you know, I'm like this little, you know, I look like a little college kid, you know, 22 years old, you know, and I'm, I'm six, one, I'm kind of athletic, but I'm maybe like, you know, 180 pounds, 175 pounds, you know, I hadn't started working out or lifting or anything. So immediately all these mobsters come to me cause I got an Italian last name. They want to know like where I'm from, who my dad is, you know, see if there's any type of connection. So immediately I'm on the compound and everybody sees the mobsters and the mobsters are kind of like one of the groups in prison that, you know, they're kind of, you know, respected, you know, they're, they have that, you know, mythical stuff from all the movies and a lot of them usually have money and they're killers. So, you know, people are kind of wary of them. And then at the same time, I'm in Manchester, Kentucky in this brand new prison. And, um, like right when you go in there, like, where are you from? Where are you from? Even though my case was from Virginia, I grew up in California. I grew up in Southern California. So, you know, I'm like from California. So they're like, okay, we're going to, we're going to send your homeboys at you. You know, we're going to tell them there's a new California guy here. So there's only like five dudes from California in the, in the whole prison in Kentucky. But all those five dudes are all like the Mexican Serrano gangbangers who are like, they're like considered like the most vicious dudes in prison. So I immediately come in, I got 25 years. So people are like, you know, what'd you do? Did you murder somebody? How'd you get all that time? Cause it was right when they, they made these laws, you know, they made like the mandatory minimums and fe federal sentencing guidelines, like around 88. That's, you know, so I was in like that first wave, you know, my case was like 91. So immediately I got this shitload of time. The mobsters are coming to me. So people are seeing the mobsters and then the, you know, like the Vato locals are coming to me, you know, and people are like, you know, like who the fuck is this little white kid? You know, so it was kind of like, you know, if I would have went into a different prison, you know, somewhere where, you know, I didn't have those dynamics, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe I would have stabbed somebody, you know, maybe I would have killed somebody, you know, who knows what could have happened. So, you know, looking back, I always consider myself like, uh, you know, I was, I was lucky in that regard in the situation I was put in, you know, even though I, I had 25 years, you know, and that, that sucked, but, you know, I was just lucky that all those dynamics kind of, you know, coalesced around me you know, when I first went in. Yeah, but dude, 25 fucking years. Holy shit, man. Like, that's almost like my life's over. Yeah, but when, when you get it, I mean, you got to do it. You don't have no choice, man. I mean, what, you, you can at least you can escape. Yeah. I know motherfuckers that turn themselves in. Oh, yeah. See, I got Jack. They say, you know, like, I got Jack Rabbit in my blood. Like, I'm, I'm going to run. You got to catch me. Oh, dude, listen. Some, something happened to me where, you know, you got to go do three to five. I might turn myself in and voluntarily go show up and report. You give me any serious time? Dude, you're going to fucking have to catch me first because, first of all, what are they going to do? Tack on another two? Yeah. So instead of 25, you got 27 because you tried to run. Well, fuck, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that chance, I think. Just allegedly, by the way, folks, allegedly. You don't want, you don't want that, those words out there. 
the number one reason most criminals are in jail their own mouth do you agree oh yeah definitely dudes put cases on themselves by talking to the police that's why they say what does every lawyer say keep your mouth shut but still dudes try to talk their way they try to talk their ways out of things to the cops and that's if you know if if you're a criminal if you're doing crime the cops are not your friend i mean you know it's like two sides of a coin you know that's what they're there they're there to bust you and put you in jail so i mean you're not going to talk your way out of it no matter of fact they're going to build a case against you yeah yeah keep your mouth shut get a lawyer um stay away from the what you call them punks yeah. uh don't gamble and don't do drugs yeah that's a, that's like the three rules and, man right when i came in and by the way that still don't mean nothing you still might have a real rough road ahead of you but those are the guarantees there's also little things like when someone's mopping and you walk right oh you don't mop over you don't walk over the floor when they're mopping you don't no, that's like somebody will stab you for that, you know, because or reaching across their tray. Oh no, you don't do nothing like that. Like it, like when you're sitting down and eating. Because I'm yeah. talking to one dude, he was giving me all kinds of tips. Like, like if you if you if you reach over someone's tray, yeah, yeah, they, they'll you, you, that's almost like no, that's a violation, major man. disrespect. Yeah. And you got to you got to give people room. Like you can't be up on. You know, I still get. You know, I'm getting more. I've been in the world seven years, so you know, it's it's a, it's a constant. You know. You know, I'm always adapting, but uh, how pleasurable you know, like, is it though? Oh, being in the world, oh man, I mean, like you ain't gonna fuck around again, are you? Nah, but you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just like, really, to me, it's like the freedom, you know, to do what you want because I was so restricted. Like, you know, it's, it's just the freedom, you know, to go buy the clothes that you want, you know, to go eat where you want, you Take know, a shit when you want. Yeah, it's just that's that's what it is. It's it's a freedom, you know, it's a freedom of choice, and um. Dude, I told someone the other day, dude, I'd rather I'd rather be working at a 7-Eleven, living in the one bedroom shack above it, free, than than in prison. Like, oh, yeah, like no. what, one thing that I will not risk is prison. Yeah, like, oh, prison it, sucks, man. It, like, you I ain't mean, get, you ain't I ain't doing nothing. Like, come to me with some scheme. Fuck you, ain't doing it. Dude, we can make millions. I don't care. Yeah. I'd rather be broke and free than rich with even a risk. Of prison you know what i always tell people right like you know the movie like the matrix right so like i was like not in the matrix you know for 21 years like i was in like that other world you know that they depict in that movie so like i'm, I'm like that guy like when i came back out i'm like man plug me in the matrix you know what i'm saying yeah. i'm like plug me in i want to enjoy you know because because like i say i know in this world, you know, if you got the right mindset, I mean, you, you can make money, man. You can make money if you work hard and you're smart and you take your opportunities when they come. You know, it's not, not like you got to work at McDonald's for the rest of your life in this country. You got to have the drive and ambition and the know-how, you know, but but I think, you know, it starts. It's like where they say, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. So that's like when I came in, that's what I felt like, like just, you know, plug me back into the matrix. I want to be in this capitalistic system and I want to, you know, basically like you know exploit or manipulate manipulate it to benefit me in the best way that i can take advantage why wouldn't you yeah so so what made you decide like movies and documentaries and you got a new documentary coming out in a while about about uh humboldt county and yeah and, humboldt and county weed growers you, you the one on white boy rick white boy rick was if for those of you that may not have seen it. It's on Netflix still, right? Yeah, it's on Netflix right now. Yeah. But it was pretty good. But this white boy, Rick was just some dude that, uh, got caught up in some drug dealing. He, he was guilty, but not as guilty as, as they laid into him. And they made a freaking case out of his ass. How long he do? He did 33 years. So he had a life sentence for eight and a half kilos of cocaine and he got busted when he was 17. And, you know, while he was in, like in 2012, the Supreme Court said that you couldn't give a life sentence to anybody under 18. And like he still it still took, you know, he just got out. He just got out like about, you know, a little over a year ago. So it still took from 2012 you know, to a little over a year ago to get him out. So, you know, I, I actually started writing. I started writing Rick when I was in prison around 2005 and we started corresponding back and forth because I was writing these books in prison called street legends. And basically my street legend series is where I take a lot of the, these like, uh, you know, gang bangers or these drug Lords or these mafia guys. And I kind of do like the Billy, the kid 
Jesse James stuff. You know, I kind of romanticize and, and glorify it. You know, because when I was in there, I was writing for my peers, and my peers were other prisoners, and that's what they liked, right? So when I first started writing, Rick, you know, because I had heard about him, you know, because I was in this uh, jail, uh, SEI Beckley in West Virginia, and there was a lot of Detroit dudes there. So, like, on the yard, like, they were talking about this guy, White Boy Rick, and I'm like, who, who the fuck is this dude, White Boy Rick? And, you know, this allegedly 17-year-old white kid that was running the black underworld, you know, like this, he, this dude has a tremendous, you know, mythology around him. And so I started writing him cause I wanted to tell his story and my street legends, but then the stuff that he was telling me didn't kind of jive with what I was trying to write, you know, cause I was trying to do like this Billy the kid type story about him. And, um, you know, he was telling me crazy stuff. Like he was working as an informant, you know, when he was 14, you know, and then like they railroaded him, you know, with eight and a half kilos and set him up and kind of like buried him and gave him a life sentence, you know, so he wouldn't like expose the mayor's office in Detroit. And at first I couldn't write about that. Cause I was like, you know, that's like not the story I'm telling. That's not the story I'm writing. But, you know, I kept the correspondence up with him, you know, Cause we both kind of identified with him cause we were both young white kids. that got a, a, you know, long since since involved in drugs. And, um, you know, eventually after I'd been in like 10, 12 years, you know, I, I got, I think my writing kind of opened up and it kind of grew where I started seeing the system for what it was. And I started doing more like criminal justice reform, you know, and I'd be kind of, kind of, a, a advocate, you know, I started seeing like the, the racial injustice and stuff like that, but it took me a minute. So then I started writing, you know, about the corruption of law enforcement. And, and once I kind of got my head around that, you know, then, then that's when I started writing about it. I was writing about his story, like while I was in, you know, for vice and, uh, you know, vice news and the fix. And then, uh, that was like, when I got out, you know, I wanted to do a film, but not only did I want to do a film, I, I wanted to get him out of prison because I was like, I thought it was fucked up. I'm like, why is this dude doing life for eight and a half kilos? And he was worked as an informant. Was uh, you just writing him at the other prison? Yeah, yeah. That's a, a lot of people that, that I wrote my books about. Um, you know, it's illegal for one prisoner to write another prisoner. But, you know, I would just do it indirectly. I would send it out you know, to my girl who act, who eventually became my wife. And she would just like, you know, put in a different envelope and, uh, you know, rewrote it to him. And we would write back and forth like that, you know, through a third party. Dude, I'll tell you one thing about people in prison. There's some innovative motherfuckers. Oh, yeah, definitely. Dude, like you can get some seriously clever, ingenious shit. Like with their, their fishing lines or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's what you do when you're in the hole, like when you're in the shoe. Yeah, but I mean, like, think about that shit, dude. Like, who thinks of these things? They've they've got all kinds of ways. They got people that can bake a fucking apple pie in a microwave like you've never seen. Yeah. Food chefs, freaking ingenious escape artists, freaking, you know, it's crazy. But when you got all that time to do nothing but think, you yeah, know. That's look, what it is. That's look. what it is. But I mean... We, Take that on the outside now. Like, you know, we're entrepreneurs. We're not doing anything criminal. Nobody, nobody takes time to think. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of distractions out here, man. Like, look, in prison, life moves really slow. Like, look, when I was in prison, you know, the highlight of my day was like mail call. You know, like who thinks that? And, and like, lunch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like the highlight. You know, like we, we would have like uh, every, every week they, they serve like hamburgers and fries. Like it was usually like on a Wednesday. And so that for us, that was like McDonald's. And you know, it's crazy. Like for 21 years, like it was like a thing in there. Oh, we're going to McDonald's. We're going to McDonald's. You know, every Wednesday we're going to McDonald's, you know, hamburger and french fries. When I got out, I went to McDonald's and I was like, man, I was like, this fucking sucks, man. I was like, you know, like I built it up in my head for like 21 years, you know, and then I got out and I, I had like the real McDonald's and I was just like, you know, like, I don't, I don't think, you know, I've gone to McDonald's a couple of times here and there, but you know, really, I haven't really partaken of, of McDonald's, you know, since. What job did you have? Did you have a job? Yeah. So this, this is kind of how it led to my writing too. Cause when I first got in, you know, I played sports, you know, I played, I played basketball, I played soccer, you know, I've always was real athletic. So I got a job in the rec department. And I started keeping like the stats, you know, I would run the books for like the basketball games and I would compile the stats, you know, for like the softball, the soccer, basketball, you know, like, you know, rebounds, points per game, you know, batting average hits, stuff like that. And I would do those stats and I would post them up on the board, like in the rec and in the units, you know, so people could see, you know, who, you know, 
people in prison, like, you know, just like how they have the MLB or whatever. They like that. That's like our little intramural leagues. And so people from other prisons kept coming and saying, hey, man, why don't you do a paper? And I was like, like, what do you mean? You know, a paper. And they were like, you know, like a little sports newsletter, you know, to, to go along with the stats you're writing about. And so I still, I was like, man, I didn't really know what they meant. So they kind of brought me, you know, they, they, cause like the dudes that they write about, like they save those little, you know, sports newsletters from prison, you know, they send them home to their family and they save them. Cause that's like their little accolades and stuff, you know, their memories, just like you would do it like in high school or, you know, a pro would, you know, get news clippings. So they show these to me. And at the same time, I was reading these columns like uh, USA Today. I used to get the USA Today paper every day because I was like a sports fanatic. And I was reading these columns like Peter Vesey had like an NBA column like in the uh, in the 90s. And Dick Vitale had like a college basketball column. So they were just like these little, you know, kind of, you know, witty, clever columns where they kind of talked about players and said what they wanted. So, you know, using these two models, one from USA Today and one that the guys from other prisons were showing me, I went to the rec supervisor and I was like, hey, man, I got this idea. You know, I want to do this instead of, you know, compiling the stats. I go, I just want to write like these little sports newsletters. And that was like, at the same time, I was taking college classes through correspondence. So I was like learning, you know, how to write. You know, and so I started doing this and I actually did that in the prisons from like 93 to 99 before I ever got anything published. You know, I was just writing, you know, like these sports newsletters and that that like became my job. You know, it was an easy job, too. It was like a cush job because I had a high pay grade because I was doing something that, you know, other people, you know, didn't want to do or couldn't do. And, you know, I didn't really have to be anywhere. You know, I just had to, you know, I had a typewriter. You know, they gave me like a typewriter and then eventually a word processor. And then, you know, eventually when I did start writing for publication, like, you know, I, I exploited all that, you know, to do stuff that would help me when I got out. Did you, did you have like tons of commissary? Yeah. I mean, it, it, at times, you know, the, the way they do it, I mean, you can only spend like a certain amount of money a month, but, uh, you know, like I say, I, w I was getting money on my books and, you know, I had a pretty good job. So, I mean, I, I was never like hurting, you know, but I wasn't, they had dudes like that would, you know, sold drugs or would smuggle drugs in through the visiting room and they would literally have like bags and bags of commissary, like under their bunk, you know, or like, you know, like thousands of books of stamps. So, you know, I was never that status, but, you know, I, I, I lived pretty good in, in prison, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, plus I, I was a kind of dude too. I mean, I was a white dude. So in there, everything like they, they call it cars, you know, like you got like the white boy car and you got like the African-American car, you got like the Spanish car. And that's like, you know, you're, you're, white's woods. Yeah. They call them woods. Yeah. Pecker woods. Pecker woods. Why pecker woods? Yeah. I don't know, man. It, I never, I mean, that's always what they call them. I don't know. I don't even know where that shit comes. I think it might come from, uh, you know, they had their, there was this book. It was a fictional book called uh, Dirty White Boy. I can't think of the author, but it was like from the 70s or 80s. And But but I think that even that book was from like a prison. I, I think it was like some prison in Oklahoma or in the South for, for whatever reason. Yeah, but I've, I've never researched like where that came from. But that's what they do, Peckerwoods. You know? So needless to say, you learned your lesson. Oh, no, definitely, man. Yeah, I mean that's a heavy lesson to learn, man. I can't even imagine. But but fortunately, dude, you ended up out, not wrapped up in the in the in the system. And when you got out, first day you got out, did you have to do a halfway house? Yeah, I did halfway house for six months. So you, you got out. You're in the halfway house. Where's that at? California? Or? No, I I was in uh you know St. St. Louis. So my wife is um, born and raised in St. Louis. So when I got out, you know, I went and lived with her. She had a house. So uh, I Wait, actually- Was she still your wife? Yeah, still my wife. Oh, no, no. Well, you met her inside? No, I met her when I was a fugitive. I started dating her about six months before I got locked up. She didn't even know my real name until the U.S. Marshals told her. So uh, she stayed with me, man. I've, I've been with that girl 28 years now, since 93. She waited 21 years for me. We got married in 2005 in prison. Damn, dude. Yeah. That's a solid girl there. No, I always tell people, like, you know how they talk about, like, the, the ride or die chick? Like, she's, like, the original ride or die chick. Like, like you know, she's, like, one in a billion. You know, like, all the writing that we've been talking about, like, the publishing house, like, all that, that was just my idea. She was the one who was actually facilitating all that stuff on the outside. Like, my whole writing career, without her, I couldn't have done it because, 
when I did start doing stuff for Vice, you know, Penthouse, Don Diva, like all these other publications, she was the one, you know, doing all the emails. She was the one setting everything up. You know, I would just tell her like, oh, tell these people this, or, you know, she was doing all the relaying information because anything in prison, all your, all your communication is like delayed, you know, eventually right before I got out, they got email, you know, so then it was quicker, but before it was just like mail, you know, so she would do like all my correspondences, you know, she would do like all the contracts for me, you know, and get me paid for stuff and find out what all these people wanted. So really I like half, half of my success is really down to her, you know, without her, I would have just been like some, you know, like a, you know, angry writer in prison that nobody ever heard about. So when you got out, she was still there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's I helpful. went right home to her in 2015. Yeah. That's helpful. Yeah. Oh no. She's been a tremendous help because, uh, you know, think I went in in 93, so there was no internet. I mean, they had cell phones, but they were like, you know, those big block phones, you know, like, like the height of technology for me when I was out was like the one 800 beeper, you know, so I didn't know about anything. So I got out, she got me like a little, uh, like an iPhone, uh, five C, you know, and I, I would just play with it like in the halfway house, you know, and ask her questions. And she kind of taught me that she taught me, you know, how to use a PC and then the MacBook. She taught me like word docs. She taught me basically everything, you know, so I, I was really lucky. And she was already, she'd been running. We started the publishing house and, and a uh, website like 2005. So by the time I got out 2015, she'd already been running this business for like 10 years, you know, so she had like 10 years of experience, you know, that she taught me. So if people want to go see your website, what is that, gorillaconvict.com? Yeah, gorillaconvict.com, G-O-R-I-L-L-A-C-O-N-V-I-C-T.com. -L -L and you guys can also follow them at Seth, S-E-T-H, Ferranti, F-E-R-R-A-N-T-I, uh, on Instagram, social media. But but so when you got out, though, like you didn't have any money. They just kicked you loose, gave you your shit, and said, see ya. You're on six months halfway house. You finally get out of the halfway house. What'd you have to do in the halfway house? Because I know you got to work. Yeah, no, I, I actually got two jobs because my, my idea when I got out of the halfway house was like, I just, I don't want to be there, you know, because I don't want to be around the people there. You know, I don't want, you know, because a lot of dudes get out, they're just trying to do drugs, you know, and get chicks, you know, and they're just basically trying to scam the system, you know, because they lived in that, you know, restricted environment. So I didn't want to have, you know, anything to do with that. I just wanted, you know, to work, you know, to get home you know, the sooner. And so I, I actually worked a job. I had a job at a kitchen and I had a job at a law firm that I actually, I still have the same job part-time at the law firm today that I got when I got out in 2015. Really? Yeah. So, so you kept your nose clean, but when did you start writing and doing movies and shit like that? Well, I'd been writing the whole time. You know, I, I published 22 books while I was in. So, um, 22. Yeah. And I did 22 books while I was in. Where can people find those? Those are all on, all on Gorilla Convict and Amazon. I'll be down. Yeah, so all books on, like, you know, gangsters, you know, mafia guys, you know, uh, you know, prison gangs, you know, prison life. But mo most of my books are about, um, I, did, I did, like, a ton of books, man, on uh, African-American gangsters, like, kind of like the dudes, you know, like, in, remember when uh, gangster rap was, like, huge in, like, the mid-90s? So all the guys that the rappers were, like, name-dropping in verse, you know, who, who have come be kind of, like, a part of the lyrical lore of hip-hop, I was locked up with all those dudes. So I, I started writing, I started writing their stories for this magazine called Don Diva, which they call the uh, original Outlaws Bible and this other magazine called Feds. Both of these magazines, like like in prison, like they were huge magazines in prison, but also like in, in the hip hop world, you know, they're like really big. They're kind of like the gangster mag. So I was locked up with these dudes. So I kind of started writing all their stories. You know, I kind of saw opportunity because when I first got in, I was with a lot of Colombian drug lords and a lot of mafia guys. So I would call my mom and my girl and I would say like, get me books on these guys, you know, cause I'm like, they're like, might be like my next door neighbor or something, you know, and I want to find out about them. You know, I have a curiosity. So I would read all these books, you know, about all these mafia guys and all these Colombian drug lords. Cause there was tons of books out there. So then when I started realizing like all these, you know, uh, infamous, you know, African American drug lords and gangsters, you know, were locked up with me too. I, I told my mom and my girl the same thing. I'm like, find me books on them. And they were like, there's no books on these guys. You know, there's a couple articles like on the web, you know, newspaper articles about their case, but there's really no books. Nobody's, you know, writing these guys a story. So that's when I got the idea, you know, for Gorilla Convict. I'm like, man, I'm going to tell these dudes story. Cause you know, like I said before, it was like, 
it was like a Billy the Kid Wild West thing to me. You know, like, because most of these dudes, like, like, uh, it's like they call it the crack era, like in the 80s, you know, when crack was real big and they had like all the big drug dealers, like Freeway Ricky Ross, you know, were sending, you know, the kilos of cocaine that they got from the Colombians, you know, across the nation. And so, um, yeah, like all the dudes that they kind of uh, name dropped in, in hip hop, they were part of uh, hip hop lore. You know, I was, I was locked up with these dudes. So um, I was like, went some of my went to them. And they didn't want me to write about them or they wouldn't do an interview, but some of them I went to them and they wanted to tell their story. So I started writing the books and kind of documenting, you know, that history. And uh, that's what I tell people too. Like really for prison, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like an anomaly because I was a white dude writing about African-American stories in prison. So that, that's what I tell people. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a different kind of journalist because I couldn't afford to, like, misquote somebody, you know, or, like, you know, depict somebody wrongly, you know, or, or like how they always say in the press, like, you know, I was misquoted or I don't like that, you know, how they get that. I couldn't do that because if I misquoted somebody or, you know, I depicted them in the wrong way, I mean, they would come and stab me, you know. So that's kind of how, like, I learned journalism, you know, from a – it's a really different school of journalism. But at the same time – you know, you, you got to push stuff because, you know, but the, a lot of the guys, they didn't care. It, I could say whatever the newspaper said. I could say whatever the court record said, but they were just like, you got to keep it within the code so I can't write and try to put cases on them. You know, I can't speculate. You know, like a lot of writers out here, like in the newspapers and stuff, like they speculate. Like they're basically trying to put cases on dudes. You know, I mean, maybe the cops are investigating it. Maybe not. The cops aren't investigating. But, you know, especially, you know, murder, because murder has no statute of limitations. So, you know, as long as I didn't do stuff like that, you know, they were cool. They actually liked it. You know, like they would read it. You know, they were kind of proud of it because it kind of showed, you know, what they went through and kind of showed their story and what happened to them. Yeah, I bet you they're like freaking souvenirs. Yeah, no, definitely. What's, and, what's, and the, what's the best one? My most popular one, it's called the Supreme Team. It's, it's about this dude, uh, Kenneth Supreme McGriff. He actually, um, he was one of the guys that was with, uh, you know, they had a big murder ink indictment with like Irv and Chris Gotti, you know, like in the, in the uh, mid 2000s. And that case like stemmed from him because he was in, you know, from the 80s and then he got out and he kind of hooked up with them for gangster rap. And he was kind of like their street guy, you know, that they used to take around, you know, to all the parties and stuff, you know, because in, in in the African-American communities, you know, he had like all the, the infamy and, and the notoriety and they wanted that, you know, these musicians and these producers and he was kind of like their guy. So, uh, yeah, he ended up getting life on, uh, you know, that case cause they, they connected him to a couple uh, murder for hires, you know, that they said he did, but uh, you know, is, no. he, is he in prison right now? Yeah. Yeah. He got a, he got a life sentence. Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever like write him? Yeah, no, he actually, he'll call me sometimes, you know, every now and then he'll give me a call, you know, but he, he's a real high profile dude. So sometimes, you know, like he gets put in the hole because a guy like him, like, uh, he's been around so long and, and he has so much stature and respect that, you know, in, in prison, it's like, if, if you have like, if Brad Leah was in prison, you would have problems with the prison authorities because, you know, they would say like, you got too much influence you can influence people. They don't like people, you know, they can influence people. So, you know, like a guy like Supreme, like they just throw them in the hole, you know, and they might keep in the hole sometime, like six months, 18 months, you know, ship them, put them on diesel therapy, what they call diesel therapy, what they just ride you around in the buses, you know, from prison to prison, you know, with no designation. And so that's what they do to a lot of, a lot of these guys that they think have a lot of influence because that's the thing in prison, just like in society, you know, they want to keep people at each other's throats so they can control everything, you know, except in prison, they, you know, it's really race-based and it's a scarcity of resources. So, you know, that's how they do. They keep the gangs fighting, you know, and violent so then they can make control. Because think about it, if 1,500 men in a prison decided they wanted to take over the prison, I mean, they could take over the prison, you know? So it's kind of like the same analogy, you know, like, like what we got going on out here. But I think out here they do it more with a... Uh, you know, like political parties and stuff. Well, what do you think about the, the media with all the bullshit they throw around? Yeah, I think, I mean, the media, I mean, they just kind of, you know, I, and I was part of the media for a long time. So, uh, you know, my first five years in, out, all I did was a lot of journalism, mostly like true crime stuff. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, they're just trying to, uh, 
basically get people to watch stuff. And, you know, how do you get people to watch stuff? You know, you kind of stir shit up. You kind of throw stuff out there. You know, it's it's almost like the, uh, you know, it's like it's like the kid in, in school who starts acting out. You know, he starts acting out to get that attention. So I think with our news media, it's it's kind of the same thing. You know, they're just trying, you know, and now it's like they just want those views. You know, it's all about the views. It's all about the likes, you know. So they just want, you know, because it's all, you know, I get, I think a lot of that stuff, it's all like, you know, ad, ad revenue and stuff like that. That's how they make their money. So the more people that watch, the more people are going to see the ads, you know, the more money they can charge for the ads, you know, the more they get. So, yeah, I, I definitely think the news media, you know, all, all news media, it's supposed to be unbiased, but, you know, it, it depends what the agency is. But even Vice, you know, I did a lot of stuff for Vice and I would turn in these pieces. I used to do a lot of pieces for Vice where it would be like, like, let's say something happened, you know, with President Trump or whoever. And it'd be like, what do prisoners think about it? Because I had a lot of contacts. You know, I had all these email contacts. I would email the guy. So I, I would, like, ask all these lifers, you know, all different races, you know, Spanish, you know, black, white, or just dudes I knew in because I, I would correspond with about 20 or 30 at a time when I first got out. And I would ask him, like, what do you think about this? You know, this political situation. And then... I would write it up. And a lot of times I would give like all their opinions because prisoners are pretty like, you know, some are left, some are right, some are middle of ground, you know, but it, I think it's pretty represent, representative of society too. You got a lot of different people have different beliefs, but writing for vice, like, I mean, they're left. So they would like cut out, you know, anything that was like bad about the left, they would cut out. And I had friends, like they would read the pieces and they would always be like, uh, dude, this doesn't even sound like you. And I'd be like, well, you know, the editors do what editors do. I mean, you know, I mean, they were paying me good. So, you know, I was like, okay, you know, let her, I mean, they always send it to you and say, is this cool? And I was like, you know, whatever. I'm just trying to move on to the next piece. But they, they do, depending on what outlet it is, I mean, they definitely do, uh, you know, skew shit one way or another. So what are you up to now? Now, here you are seven years later. You obviously had, uh, I would say that the documentary is successful, No. Oh yeah, White Boy has been tremendously successful. Um, and now you're doing now you're doing like they're grabbing you to do like news appearances about this laundry dude. Yeah, yeah, they've been they've been kind of going crazy. I mean, this laundry case is kind of uh, you know, gripping the nation and I I've been on Fox News, I've been on Inside Edition and I've been on News Nation uh twice. You know, News Nation that was the uh WG in America before but that's just been like in the two weeks so they, they just want me to go on and, and kind of talk about you know like the psychology of a fugitive you know what it's like and do you think, um, do you think he's his parents are helping him oh definitely definitely i don't know but now which the, would put the, them in cuffs if and when they're caught yeah yeah if if they could prove it but you know i mean how, how are they going to prove that if he doesn't say it or if the they look under doesn't. that flower bed yeah i don't know but they're saying that they just found remains that's like the latest thing like today they're saying like in that uh, reserve where they found his clothes, they're saying they found like human remains now. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I've always thought that he's either in Florida or a neighboring state. You know, that's what I've maintained the whole time. Yeah, but why can nobody find him? Like this is a massive manhunt. No, but that, that's not how, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's not, that's not how our law enforcement works, man. Our law enforcement, like there's no Sherlock Holmes on the force, man. Like, they are reactive. Like, since the 80s and the war on drugs, everything is through informants and snitches, man. You know what I'm saying? So our law enforcement, they just react. They wait for you to slip up, and then they pounce. So, I mean, they're, you know, like I'm saying, they're going out. I'm not saying they're not going out looking or whatever, but it's not like some big manhunt. He could be holed up in an apartment in Florida, and as long as he doesn't go out and nobody knows he's there, how is anybody going to see him? Yeah, but you always go out. Well, I mean, at first, you know, when, when, when I was first a fugitive, I, I stayed in a lot. You know, after about six months, yeah, I started going out because the paranoia and the fear of getting caught kind of, you know, was pushed to the background. You know, and plus, I mean, we're all human, so you want to be around people. You want to have that contact. You want to talk to people. So, you know, when that took over and the fear resided you know, then I started going out and I started stepping out, you know, resuming my life. So I think eventually if he is alive, he'll, he'll get to that point. But I mean, you know, the first, whatever, the first couple of months, man, if you don't want to get caught, you have to cut off contact with everybody, you know, and you just have to hide, you know, basically hide out, you know, but you could do that in an apartment even now. What about like fake ID? I mean, he would have to get a, a legitimate ID. I actually had 
I had a, I developed probably about 20 different IDs, but they were, they were, they weren't fake. I got them all from like DMVs. You know, I did this thing where, uh, like, again, I, I, you know, I read all these books. So when I became a fugitive, I ordered all these books. They used to have these companies called Paladin Press and Loom Panics Press. And they had like all these subversive books. Like the most popular one is, uh, that a lot of people have heard of is like the anarchist cookbook. You know, like everybody's pretty much heard of that. So they have all these subversive books, and um, that's what I would do. I order these books like uh, Reborn in the USA, Paper Tripping 1, 2, and 3, Understanding U.S. Identifying Documents. And by reading all these books, I figured out how you could get legitimate ID, like through government sources. So what the process is that I did is I would find somebody who was born in one state and died in another and somebody who like died like under the age of five. So then what you can do, like a lot of states, they don't cross-reference birth and death certificates. Like, you know, if you're born in Las Vegas and you die in Las Vegas, then they're gonna stamp deceased on the birth certificate. But if you, you know, this America, people move all over. So the states are not cross-referencing birth and uh, death certificates, you know? So I would get the birth certificate, I would look through obituaries, from the obituary, you got enough information to get the death certificate. So I would order the death certificate from, you know, like the de Department of Vital Statistics. You know, you just say like you're the person's Ann or whoever. Then with the obituary and the death certificate, I got enough information to get the birth certificate. So then I order that, you know, from the, the Vital Statistics Bureau or whatever it's called. And then once I had the birth certificate, I'm home free because then I can go right into a DMV. And back then, I don't know if it's true now, but back then, with a DMV, as long as you got a birth certificate, you could get like what they call a walker's license, you know, just like an ID. You know, you needed to verify a social security number to get a driver's license, but even the social security numbers were easy to verify because all you had to do was get like a W-2 form. You know, like all businesses do W-2 forms. So you could go to a business office supply co, buy the uh, W-2 forms, and then you could like make up and if you had that book, Understanding U.S. Identifying Documents, it tells you like how the social security numbers are broke down, like from what state and what years the number correspond to, because the only random ones are the last four. The first three and the middle two correspond to years and what state it issues. So, you know, if you see somebody was born in Rhode Island, that's what the birth certificate says. You put that Rhode Island code for the social security number and you put that right in the W-2 and that they would accept that. You know, and then you're home free. You know, even if they got a mail, you just give them a mailing address, you know. So how'd they catch you? I mean, they caught me because I, I kept I kept selling drugs. You know, I got, you know, after the first six months, I was kind of hiding out, you know, low profile. But then, you know, I was a young kid, man. I, want, I wanted my life back. You know, I didn't want to hide out in an apartment and not have any contact with people. But you, you know? could have got away with it if you'd have just stopped and stayed under those fake IDs for the rest of your life. Yeah, I mean, and and I've seen people that have done that. You know, you hear about that all the time. People, you know, 20, 25 years, 30 years, never get caught. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I, was, I was a little wild, man. I was kind of, uh, I wouldn't say I was addicted to drugs, but I was addicted to the lifestyle. You know, I liked being kind of the rock star. You know, and, and for me, you know, selling the drugs, you know, the money. And it, it's, it's, it's not even you know, like the drugs or the taking drugs or the party. I mean, that all comes with it, but it's like the, uh, it's like the lore. It's like, you know, when, when, when you're that guy that has the weed or the LSD or whatever, I mean, you're like in high demand, you know? So that's what it was for me. It was like that rock star thing, you know, and I kept doing it and I eventually got caught, you know, but I think, I think Brian Laundry. I mean, if he's not dead, he's going to have to, you know, he, that's what he's got to be thinking you say, about now. Why would you say if he's not dead, why would he be dead? I mean, I'm just going off what the reports we're talking about, you know, just today. I'm not following the case. Yeah, my, yeah. my wife seems to, but like, yeah, because they said they said they found human remains. So, you know, some newspapers are saying, you know, could speculating that it could be him. Yeah, I mean, there's been no official human where they remains just, where in that uh, that Carlton Reserve, like where they found where he was supposedly camping out. But they confirmed he was alive after they found the girl dead. Oh yeah, 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 because he was camping out at the. Uh, the Carlton Reserve, this was after he came well, back to the, Florida. They would know already if it was him. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just going from the news report, so I'm sure they're going to clarify that. They just found next, out today? Yeah, it was. I think it was just reported today. Well, yeah. maybe he killed someone else. Could be true, yeah. Maybe. Well, we'll know, know soon. Yeah. It ain't going to take him long to figure out if it's the dude, right? No, not. It's not if they got DNA. And if it's him, 
then what was the cause of death? Maybe you got ate by alligator. <laughs> was it in Florida? Yeah. Yeah. I've always said though too, you know, I've, I've maintained like on all these news shows when I've talked about it, I've said like, uh, I mean, you know, everybody deserves their day in court. You know, this is America, but you know, if, if he did hurt that girl, I mean, he deserves everything he has coming and more. And, you know, when you do go to prison, I mean, you know, besides informants, you know, inf informants are, are looked down upon, but, uh, you know, rapists, child molesters, and guys who hit women or hurt women. I mean, those are like the four lowest things. And, you know, it depends on the prison. You, you know, the, the higher level institution you're at, like those guys, like they're not allowed to walk. Like they can't go on the yard. You know, like if they're on the yard and you find out what they're in for, like, you know, you just got to go punish them, you know, and hurt them to get them off the yard. That's kind of like the, the rules. And someone's going to. Oh, yeah, yeah. They have to. Yeah. It's part of the code. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, especially like like in there, if you're white and it's a white dude, I mean, it's up to the whites. You got to go do it. You know, if you don't do it, like if a snitch walks or a chomo walks or a rapist walks. What's a chomo? Child molester, like a pedophile. So if one of those guys are walking and they're white and you don't, as a white guy in prison, like as a white, you know, solid convict. Group. Yeah, if you don't clean clean house like clean your car keep your car clean and let those guys walk that reflects on you and and you'll like lose respect in the prison hierarchy with the other races you know crazy it's like a twisted man it's actually not crazy actually mm -hmm. you know i'll tell you you know some of the rules i've heard in prison i wish we were out here yeah the only thing what what, what i've noticed since after being out seven years like you know i i, I kind of live by those you know like the convict code or whatever you want to call it in prison and it helped me thrive, you know, and survive. But, you know, like a lot of those things, like when you get out here, you can't, you can't live by those same codes because, you know, like there, you know, if somebody bumps into you, you know, or like somebody reaches, like how we were talking about earlier, reaches across you or just like, yeah, you know, you, well can't, that, you just can't check that stuff. I mean, cause people are always bumping into you. People are always going to be rude. You just gotta, you know, if you were like trying to check all that stuff, like all day, every day, that's all you would be back doing. in there. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Yeah, I don't mean like that, but I mean like the, the, there's there's things that you do like you just show respect to everyone. Yeah. Well, you don't need contracts. It's all verbal. It's all handshake. You know that's that's what I like because even even in business today, I mean for my film stuff, I mean I do all work for hire, so I, I get contracts because you got to get contracts to cover your ass. You know, but you know, but I mean like a lot of people, you know, it depends on who you're doing with. But certain people, you can just do like handshake agreements even out here today. But I'm saying that's mostly. That's not how business is done, especially in the film industry, because they say like in the film industry, like once the contracts are signed, you know, the lo people's lawyers are trying to figure out how they can fuck each other over. Yeah, where's you know? the loopholes? Yeah. So what are your goals, bro? From here on out, anyone listening to Bomb Squad, I'm sure they're going to freaking follow you, read your book, support you in some way. I think it's freaking incredible that you spent that much time and still had a freaking, you know, success minded head on your shoulders. I saw the freaking documentary. That was good, but that was about white boy. Why don't you do one on yourself? No, I've been I've been talking to people. You know, there's been some talks. Like I, I just got to find the right situation. So you know, I've been talking about a series, movie, docu series. You know, so dude, a little bit of weed, some LSD doesn't deserve 25 years. Oh no, definitely not. But you know, like like I take it too. Like whatever. I mean, whatever happened to me happened to me. You know, I'm not gonna say it happened for a reason. But everything that happened made me who I am today, and I, I'm happy. You know where where I'm at today and you know basically like for the future you know I'm just trying to I want to keep making films you know I'm making these documentaries now but eventually you know I want to jump into feature films you know like like my heroes are, are guys you know like Quentin Tarantino oh yeah you know Guy Ritchie you know so that's kind of who I who I fancy myself like you know now documentaries the budgets you know are only a couple hundred thousand dollars but you know eventually you know, I want, I want to show and prove. I want to be in charge of like a three to $5 million project. Then I want to be in charge of like a 10 to $20 million project. And you know, like any, as a director, I mean, the ultimate goal, I mean, I will, you know, I want to be like in charge of like a hundred, hundred, you know, million dollar, you know, like CGI, you know, Marvel, you know, type of movie, you know, I mean, that that's, I think that would be the dream of any filmmaker, you know, so that's, that's what I'm moving towards. But, you know, I don't gotta, like, I tell people all the time, I say, I don't have to jump right to the end. You know, I'm very patient. If prison taught me anything, it, it taught me patience. You know, I'm only 50. I can make films for the, you know, the next 20 years, you know, maybe 30 years, you know, at least 20, but I don't mind going one step 
one step up the ladder at a time, you know, because I know in this country and, and in life in general, it's about you got to show and prove. You know, if somebody gives you an opportunity, you know, you got to take it and you got to show it and you got to prove it. And especially, you know, with films and investors, you know, you got people invest money in you. You got to give them their money back and their profit, you know, and then, you know, you move to the next level. What's your uh, Tangled Roots, that little trailer you showed me like that looks good. Did you direct that? Yeah, so that's I'm directing that. So so Tangled Roots is um it's about Southern Humboldt. It's about the Emerald Triangle. It's going to be a four part uh, limited docu series, and basically what it does is it tells a story of of Humboldt County. It goes all the way back to the 70s because you know Humboldt County is like way up in Northern California, and at one time like in the 80s and 90s, this little area was supplying 60 percent of the gross national product for cannabis, you know, like on, on the, I call it the traditional market, you know, the legal market, but I, I refer to it as a traditional market now. So now I, I go back all the way to the seventies. Like, you know, why did these people move up there in the first place? A lot of it were people from the sixties, you know, a lot of the hippies, like they were dissatisfied with society and they basically just wanted to fuck off. So they moved out, you know, and, and grew all their own food and they didn't even go out there to grow weed. You know, they, they just moved out there to kind of fuck off and, you know, reject society. And then, you know, a byproduct was they smoked weed. So they just started growing it. So eventually, you know, this grew into where they could start making money, like in the late seventies, eighties, you know, and they started making a lot of money and, uh, people would like go up there. And plus, cause the, the way the environment is up there, you know, like the sun, cause it's one of the only places you know, where it could be like 100 degrees during the day and it can be like 50 degrees at night. And so like the cannabis plant like really responds really well to those extremes, you know, in temperature. So they just started growing like there's really, you know, like like bomb ass, you know, weed like back in the 80s, what I would call kind bud. And, um, you know, then like when the war on drugs came, they basically like militarize this area, man. They have like, you know, helicopters flying. And this is like a small area. It's like, you know, it's, it's not even a whole County. It's Southern Humboldt. And they just kind of targeted this area. And, you know, these outlaw growers, basically they went through the war on drugs, you know, went through everything they went through. And the story goes all the way up, you know, to, 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 to today where basically, you know, now a lot of these guys are like losing their livelihood because they can't compete with the like big ag and the big farmers. So I'm just trying to tell this story, you know, because to me, um, Humboldt County should be like the Napa Valley cannabis. They grow the best cannabis, you know, and like, like, uh, they're never going to be you know, They can't compete with like the, you know, Jack Daniels or like the Marlboros. I mean, there's all this is America. So there's always going to be these big brands that, you know, have a lot of money behind them. They can beat everybody. But I think, you know, they need to have like, a, they need to be recognized as like the craft cannabis market. And I think these people, you know, need to make money, you know, for growing this really good weed. And that's kind of what this uh, whole docuseries is about. You know, I want to entertain I want to educate, but also, um, just like the white boy, Rick doc, I, I was pissed off that white boy, Rick had a life sentence. So I made that doc and I'm pissed off that a lot of these little farmers are getting squeezed out, you know, by big ag. So, um, when they're basically like the trailblazers, so, you know, that, that makes me angry. So, you know, that's why I'm making this doc, you know, everything I do, I, I, I gotta have a passion to, you know, I just don't like, I make stuff. I tell people all the time, I make stuff that I want to watch, you know? So, you know, just like all the books I wrote, I wrote books that, that I wanted to read. So I, I kind of go with that same premise now. So, um, yeah, that's a big project I'm, I'm working on right now that I should, uh, have ready, you know, next summer. And then once I get it ready, I'll go to a sage, sales agent and, um, try to get it placed somewhere. What about Jesus Christ junkie? Jesus Christ junkie was, um, when I first got out, you know, I first got out, I, I wanted to be a filmmaker before I got out, you know? So like when I got my master's degree, I took a whole bunch of like, you know, film courses, like whatever I could, like through correspondence and, you know, like script writing and Jesus Christ junkie is this film that I did on uh, YouTube, like the first summer when I got out, like in, uh, 2015, I just got like some college kids, you know, I told them I had this script and um, I did this little series. It's called the Easter Bunny Assassin series. It was four parts. And when I was in prison, I had this idea. I was like, what happens if you take like these holiday characters, you know, or like traditional characters like Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, you know, Jesus Christ. And um, 
you kind of mix in, you kind of juxtapose it with like crime stuff. So, you know, that's what it, I got the Easter bunny assassin. I got the tooth fairy mafia Don. I got Santa Claus crack dealer and I got Jesus Christ junkie. And basically what that little series is, is the Easter bunny assassin. He just goes around and, and he whacks all these other characters, you know? So that's kind of like, that's on YouTube. It's had, it hasn't had a lot of, it was, it's kind of was like guerrilla filmmaking, but it was like my thing, right? When I got out, I was like, okay, I want to be a filmmaker. So that's kind of like what I did. So that's on my YouTube channel. Where, where's your YouTube channel? It's at uh, Seth Ferrante. Seth Ferrante, folks, on YouTube. See, that's what I mean, though. Like, you got out, you wanted to do it, you're doing it. Like, freaking, you, you, you somehow freaking weathered 20-some years in the old pokey. You didn't get killed. You're not freaking all tatted up. Not that that's a bad thing, but like usually you come out of prison with some tattoos. Yeah. Um. You know, you got it. You got a. You got a solid mind, bro. I, I'm freaking. I admire. You know the the grit, the perseverance, and you know hopefully one of these days I'm watching a movie by you that's Quentin Tarantino style. Yeah, that's and, the goal. And huge, folks, go follow him at Seth Ferranti on Instagram. Gorilla Convict. If you want to read these books, these books are. You know, you got a ton of them. Prison Stories, Street Legends, Volume 1 and 2, The Supreme Team, Confessions of a College Kingpin 1 and 2. Like, dude, you've been, you've been working. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty prolific, you know. Um, and that, that's what I always tell people. A lot of people ask me, like, wh what is, you know, like my best talent or what is my best tribute? And I tell people, look, there's people, I mean, they're more talented. They're better writers. They're better filmmakers. They're better athletes. You know, they work out better. They're better looking. There's people that are better in every category. You know, I've never been the best at everything. I'm pretty good at a lot of stuff, but I tell people my number one attribute is I'm relentless. You know, when I decide I want to do something, I do it and I complete it. Cause you hear all the time, people talk about, they want to do this. They want to do that. You know, whether it be business arts, you know, life goals, whatever. And most people, they never do it. So I pride myself on being that type of person. When I set out to do something, you know, I do it you know, I finish it, but I also, you know, I do it to the best of my ability at that time, you know, cause like, like I, like even I can look back at that Easter bunny assassin stuff, you know, and I can kind of look at it now, you know, now that I got a film on Netflix and I kind of cringe, you know, cause at the production value, cause now I'm doing this real high production value stuff. But at that time, that was the best I could do, you know, and I did it and I put it out to the world. So I always what? say that, man, I'm, I'm like, I'm like super relentless and prolific. What if someone's is, that's, digging you right now they got a little dough and they want to you know maybe partner with you on a, on funding some sort of project would you be open to that oh yeah definitely man i'm, I'm always looking to investors so hitch up at gorilla convict yeah yeah well i got I, my other site seth ferrante.com but it's all the same site yeah but you can you can contact me it'll send an email right to me because yeah, one of these days dude probably be a year or two for me but i'm gonna i'm gonna make a real movie yeah not a, it could be a docuseries it could be based on a true story but I'm going to make a real movie, dude. And maybe I'll freaking be the dude that funds that three to five, puts you in charge of it. Just make sure let's, I look good. Let's do it. I'll make you look good. Yeah, one of these days I'm going to I'm gonna make a movie, dude. It's either going to be a damn expensive souvenir to show my grandkids or it's going to freaking launch my acting career, which will be the final phase of my life. Yeah. You know, when I started out, I was going to be an actor. Yeah. I well, guess. hey, sometimes you, you got to keep following those dreams, man. That's what well, it's about. What, I, what happened to me is I got a starring role in a movie, you know, through the traditional route, auditioning and whatnot. Um, thought I was cool, you know. Ended up getting cut right before production because the producer's son got out of a drug rehab, and they gave him my part. Well, the writers who wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, Ken Kesey, um, they wrote a new part for me, just for me. And so the movie now was a dream sequence. They had a beginning, which was me, and now I'm playing my character's son. But I got a little tiny front and back part because the writers felt so bad, number one. Number two, they like me, but they literally changed the whole movie. We went up to film it, and, uh, you know, I got a little piece. And then, you know, the film business, dude. It ended up not coming out, and there was all kinds yeah. of issues. And uh, irrelevant. It wouldn't have made me a star in any way, but the producer's son took my uh, role. And back then I was like probably 19, 18, 19. And, and I didn't get it. I was like, what do you mean? Like I, you know, I have a contract. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. But you know, he makes the decisions. So it made me think, you know, I'm going to go get rich so I can be the producer and then no one can ever do this again. Yeah. So I'll be back movie business. And I thought, you know, oh, I'll just go get rich in a couple of years. I just didn't know it'd take my whole life. 
But now that I'm getting to a position where, you know, if I lose three to five mil, and I don't think I will because, dude, like, you know, you make a good movie, you get a good team, you write a yeah. good script. You're no, gonna... no, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like anything in business, man. Like, you know, I mean, you're a business guy, so you know some people, they go into business, and you could just tell, like, looking from the outside, like, this is not going to work. So you got to get the right team, man. It's all about building the team. You know, it's about building the structure. It's about having the right figurehead. I mean, just film – it's like anything in life, man. Anything you gotta have the right people that know what they're doing, and you gotta. I always say, I say to people like when I hire people, right? I say, I don't want a mercenary. Like if you're just here for the money, I don't want you. I want you here because you're passionate about the material. Because then if the person's passionate about the material, yeah, you gotta pay them, but they're gonna go the extra mile. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, and that's how you win. Well, it boils down to me, you know, the the the, the dialogue, the script, the actors, the director which is massively important that, you know, the, the soundtrack, the scoring, you know, the whole shebang, but yeah. I'm going to do one. So who knows, maybe I'll be your first three to five guy and then yeah. that'll kick you off into the freaking hundred guy. And then you'll just keep getting me in your movies. That'd be awesome. One of these days, folks, one of these days you might see old BL in the old movies. I did stand up comedy the other night cause no one thought I would. Yeah. No, I saw that you too. And I saw, I was watching that video and, uh, that's what you say. You just went up off the top of your head, right? Well, I had a few. I had a few jokes thought about, but I've never, you know, performed my act or anything. Yeah, yeah. So, so they told me I I wouldn't get up there, and I'm like, of course I'd get up there. All right, dude, it's not as easy as you think. And I says, come on, bro. So right when I walked up there, when I opened it up, I said, you know, they were all shocked I got up here because I didn't have a set. When in reality, I got a set or whatever, and then that just kicked me off into that whole diatribe, which. From a pro's perspective, it, I probably didn't do very well. But for a first timer, for a non comedian, I had a lot of people that were in comedy go, "Dude, if that's your freaking beginning, dude, you got yeah. a career here." So it's like, dude, when I put my mind something, I'm the same way you are, yeah. and that's why I always tell people. I did a podcast earlier where they say, "Well, you know, when when did you give up acting? I haven't given it up. I'm on a motherfucking hiatus. Yeah, and one of these days I'm coming back, and I'm gonna be." The producer, so nobody's firing me, and we're going to come out with a badass movie. My favorite, I think, writer of all time is Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, you ever, love, you ever see Quentin Tarantino. You ever see True Romance? Yeah, I've seen them all. Dude, True Romance all is the yeah. best movie ever. Yeah, that was the one he just wrote. He didn't even direct it. But he that was unbelievable flick. Yeah. What's funny is Michael Rappaport, he's coming on the podcast one of these days. He follows me on social media. I didn't follow him. But he followed me apparently, and he goes, "Dude, I like your shit." And I'm looking, I'm like, "This is motherfucking Michael Rappaport, dude." Yeah, yeah. I'm like, "No fucking way, dude." So one of these days, dude, I want to go pick out kind of like what Quentin did for John Travolta. Yeah, you got to bring people back. I want to go yeah. get certain people, man. That That's the way did. you do it. That's because yeah. you can get them cheap. And not only that, like, dude, they were fucking good. Where'd they go? Yeah. Like, uh, you remember, like, he, they might be dead by the time I'm done, but like Gene Hackman. Yeah. Gene Hackman was good. Remember Gene Hackman? Yeah, yeah, no, he was awesome. But anyway, folks, listen, go follow this dude. Uh, get his books. Support him any way you can. Go to Netflix. Watch his documentary, White Boy. They're coming out with a white boy with Matt McConaughey now. Are you getting paid for that, or is that just on their own? No, they that already came and came out like 2018. Came out around the oh, same time. Yeah, yeah. Did they uh, did they uh, base it off yours or no? No, it no was it, we, it was in production at the same time. You know, but I knew about it because Rick. You know, Rick Rick had a deal with them. He, you know, he had like his team. Yeah, yeah. So he had a deal with them, and then he he gave us permission to do his doc too. You know, like through me. So, right on. Yeah. Well, folks, you guys heard it here. Go out. Share this with somebody else. They might pick up something that they need to get past some shit in life. That's why we always keep it real on dropping bombs. Share it, rate it, and until next time, keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.